Good morning. So, today's class is about the western classic American genre considered an exclusively American product along with gangster. However, the concept existent in, uh, existed in France too, but not uh, it never met uh, popularity of uh, the Hollywood western. Uh, the western has been known to be the longest genre of all uh, apart from gangster cinema and it points to America's fascination with the frontier as a site of something new and better. Typology of the genre includes conflict between a civilization and the open range of or a wilderness and if you have noticed you consider John Wayne's The Searchers directed by the great John Ford. These are the great directors of uh, the western genre John Ford, Howard Hawks and Sam Peckinpah who is the wild bunch we will be discussing today. So, um, if you remember The Searchers by John Ford you remember that uh, you, you may recall that uh, the hero John Wayne he comes uh, uh, arrives on the scene, um, he is uh, framed in the doorway and when the movie ends again we see him framed in the doorway. Okay, so, uh, the perennial outsider, the conflict between civilization and wilderness and what does the hero prefer? Wilderness quest uh, on an eternal quest. So, protagonist operates at the point of conjuncture of these two opposing values. The western hero is the embodiment of the rugged American individualism who never wishes to or for, for some reason who could never settle down. He follows his own personal code and consider the parallels between the western hero and the gangster hero both follow their personal code of values and ethics. Uh, the western hero's personal code emphasizes courage, justice, fair play, compassion for the underdog and of course, respect for women. And if you watch classic westerns, you find all these elements in the movie. Recurring themes in a classic western include quest, quest for anything as I just said, uh, uh, we are never told, I mean Shane, what is he after? George Stevens Shane as played by Alan Ladd. What is the quest for? He is a, a uh, not exactly a shadowy figure, but a mysterious enigmatic figure who arrives from nowhere and rides out into nowhere. He just spends some time in this particular small town, rids the place of uh, its scum and then rides away. So, people like Scorsese, the other day we were talking about uh, a taxi driver, they were immensely influenced by the western hero, his alienation, individualism and loneliness. Of course, it is another kind of alienation, but nevertheless. So, the uh, western hero repeatedly shows a desire to move away from the civilizing attempts of the east and the protagonist's ideological beliefs shape the narrative. So, we go along with the hero, we, uh, we relate to the hero. In other words, hero becomes our mouthpiece, these are the ideology, these are the ideologies we believe in and we want our hero to champion and defend those beliefs. And the western is also notable for the classic depiction between the good and the evil. So, the conflict is always between the good and the bad. A brief word about uh, the historical background and origin of the western. Uh, so, the western embodies the myth of the American frontiersmanship. Okay. Frontier is represented as a site of hope for something new and better. The tradition of the cowboy as mythic hero dates back to the western dime novels published from the 1860s and these dime novels dramatized lives that were both real and fictional and elevated the cowboy to the mythic status. These dime novels also idealize the outlaws. For example, take a look at the western outlaws, Jesse James, we recently had a movie, The Assassination of Jesse James. 
Brad Pitt played Jesse James, Buffalo Bill, Billy the Kid and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. There has been a movie based on this Robert De Niro, uh, sorry Robert Redford and uh, Paul Newman. So, they were the real life outlaws and the movies glamorized them as heroes. We were also talking about uh, Bonnie and Clyde and who were also uh, real life gangsters, outlaws and glamorized in uh, Arthur Penn's movie. So, uh, at this point I like to draw your attention to uh, this extremely celebrated uh, film director Sam Peckinpah, uh, who was uh, at his peak during the 60s and he is uh, lovingly called the bloody Sam, because uh, of his fascination with blood and gore on screen. Uh, one reason for this shift, especially during the late 60s towards so much of blood and gore on his screen, um, could be uh, the socio-political climate in the US. We were talking about the assassination of JFK, Martin Luther King and also Robert F. Kennedy. So, uh, three major political assassinations, Vietnam war and the strong anti-war feelings, a Watergate scandal and all, all these things expose the myth of the American pioneering spirit. Cinema reflects these things. So, Sam Peckinpah, the Picasso of violence, celebrated for the cinema of ballot of bullets. So, there is plenty of bullets and bloodletting in uh, Bloody Sam's movies and Peckinpah's movies generally reflect the air of pessimism, suspicion and betrayal. So, western also combining the elements of noir. Peckinpah's contribution is that he brought the traditional western into the gloom of a modern ironic age. When we talk about noir and neo noir and some and classic noir and somewhere in between is Sam Peckinpah. So, he combines the traditional western and uh, the noir elements with the uh, then contemporary beliefs and gives a very mo modern and ironic edge to his films. He achieved a fusion of the western myth and the existential heroes and he is an inspiration. The other day we were talking about Martin Scorsese. So, he is an inspiration for Scorsese, Tarantino and uh, Robert Rodriguez, especially with uh, his uh, fascination for blood and gore and depiction of extreme graphic violence on screen. His movies are critique of violence. He felt that people have become inured to violence, immune to violence because of the commercials uh, shown on t television screen, the, viol the amount of violence on television screen. And there was a need to sensitize people through a heightened stylized violence and that is what Peckinpah aimed to do. Uh, almost a Hemingway-esque figure, he had seen action, flown planes, ridden horses. So, he was a very glamorous, very charismatic character himself. He was an adventurous spirit and believed in the heroic code in the American cinema. He considered religion as a repressive idea and most of his movies present him as an elegist for America, so an, an American elegist. One of his uh, famous movies is uh, Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, 1973 and uh, you find extreme violence, abundance of it, male camaraderie and ritualistic killings on screen, plenty of uh, macho posturing and um, whiskey guzzling scenes. And it is interesting to note that even kids in Peckinpah are quite violent. It is a town full of kids who amuse themselves by swinging on the hangman's noose. So, Pat Garrett is an anguished lament for the West, the West which is gone forever and will never come back. And the characters acknowledge their end in the West's decline. Uh, you would be interested to know that uh, Bob Dylan wrote a song knocking on heaven's door for this particular film. Um, 
Mexico is often used as a setting in Peckinpah. So, after his marine service in China, he was in the war, he went exploring in Mexico and most of his works are informed by political corruption, military despots, idyllic peasants and lawless roads. So, Mexico has always meant something special to me, that is what Peckinpah says, my Mexican experience is never over and always a man of Mexico. 1974, uh, a very unique, uh, a very eccentric title, Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia, starring Warren Oates, Isela Vega, Emilio Fernandez. The movie was extremely violent and it was reviled by critics as grotesque, sadistic and obscene. It is a gothic western it, and it was banned in Germany, Argentina and Sweden. We will see why. You find the image of a head in a gunny sack, it is Alfredo Garcia's head. It is rotting, it is stinking and it attracts a blanket of flies. The message is, no matter how bad a man feels, he needs to finish a job. So, the person who is bringing the head of Alfredo Garcia has a job to do, no matter how difficult it is. So, doing one's job, however uh, repellent that job may be, is one of the defining features of Sam Peckinpah. As the other day, we, when we were discussing Howard Hawks, uh, emphasis on professionalism, job satisfaction, a job well done, the so, same about Sam Peckinpah. Uh, so, uh, a word about uh, Alfredo Garcia's uh, history, it was made in the gap, it is 1974 movie, so made in the gap between the first two parts of the Godfather trilogy. Uh, both uh, it and uh, uh, Godfather first conclude with baptism services. In the Godfather, the first uh, part 1972, the liturgy was neat with the famous montage. We have been talking about the montage scene in the Godfather when we were discussing uh, the movie as a canonical text. And L. Jeff carrying his granddaughter in her uh, christening robes and Bunny who has been, who has the head of Alfredo Garcia, the father of the child. Okay. So, this is, these are the images that we have in uh, Bring Me the Head the baptism scene. So, uh, there are no neat ends and uh, no redemption, no satisfactory closure in Alfredo Garcia. The wild bunch, uh, the wild bunch is uh, uh, another highly stylized rendition and celebration of violence in Peckinpah. And uh, when it was recently uh, re-released, and uh, it was received very well and the critics called it Pulp Fiction of its time. So, we know what a cult movie Pulp Fiction is. So, that is the reputation of the wild bunch. Interestingly, heroes are aging, they are not uh, the good looking uh, actors of a standard western. So, you do not find someone as good looking as Alan Ladd or uh, even uh, uh, Gary Cooper in uh, Peckinpah. Okay. So, they, these heroes of the wild bunch, rather the anti heroes, they are aging, they are worn out and going for their last big job. So, again, emphasis on doing a job well. Uh, there is an air of despair about them, you know, the times are changing, it is not the same West anymore. And uh, Peckinpah, forever believer in the course of masculinity. So, you have plenty of macho posturing again, masculine code of honor and conduct, loyalty towards friends, a very important theme in Peckinpah. And of course, the outlaws also are very much aware that there is no hope for redemption or a better tomorrow, but a job has got to be done. So, Peckinpah heroes, typical heroes, unwashed, foul mouthed, hard drinking, okay, uh, very unchivalrous. A western hero as we just talked about should have respect for women, but you do not find that 
in, uh, in this wild bunch. They have disdain for religion and moral values and moral codes of the society, um, you know echoes of uh, Hemingway and they are laconic and alienated always on the edge kind of characters, but forever searching for a cause. Again in the Hemingway tradition, they are bound by a sense of loyalty towards each other and as we were talking about hardcore masculine conduct. So, um, what are they? They are unchanged men in a changing land, out of step, out of place and desperately out of time. So, their time is up, they are aware of this, but still they have to move on because there is nothing else to be done and this is what they are known for and this is what they got to do. They know that suddenly a new west has emerged, nine men who came too late and stayed too long. The time is clearly up, but they cannot help it and of course, they are born too late for their own times. I will read you a passage from this classic book on, on the western, it is called Stagecoach to Tombstone by Howard Hughes, not the Howard Hughes, but it is a, a film scholar and this is how he describes the uh, wild bunch. The wild bunch is most famous, I am on page 184, is most famous for the two explosive shootout scenes that raise the stakes in 60s screen violence. Arthur Penn's blood splattered finale to Bonnie and Clyde was a major influence on Peckinpah, who took Penn's bloody showstopper and extended it, deploying slow motion and squibs blood filled bags attached to the actors and then exploded with a charge. Slow motion accentuates this violence, stretching death throes and coagulating the fountains of blood in mid air. This is intercut with footage cranked at normal speed, creating surreal imagery. For the Starbuck ambush, there were 230 people and 56 horses on set. Pekin Pass orchestration of the pandemonium is inspired with the bounty hunters picking off the outlaws as they try to reach their horses. The bunch use members of a temperance parade as human shields and blast their way out of town while bystanders are trampled under horses hooves and mown down in the ferocious crossfire. So, this is what these people are, ruthless killers and if extremely cruel, they would not stop at anything um, in order to attain their goal. I read further, the strongest theme in the wild bunch is the aged outlaw's place in a rapidly modernizing world during the terror reign of General Huerta between February 1913 and July 1914. Posters stated, Unchang unchanging men in a changing land. Uh, I just read, the, uh, read out that quotation to you. And Sykes notes of the bunch, you boys ain't getting any younger and Tector goats the older men in the party. Running with brother Pike and old man Sykes makes a man wonder if it ain't time to pick up his chips and find another game. Following the disaster of the star Starbucks setup, what is left of the bunch limps out. Pike says, I like to make one good score and back off, to which Dutch uh, incredulously replies, back off to what? They no place to go. In the course of their journey, Pike and Dutch talk about the past, how Thornton once rode with them as a comrade and how Pike was wounded when the husband of his lover Aurora came home unexpectedly. Of their dealings with Mapache, Pike says, this is our last go around Dutch, this time we do it right. The arrange, uh, armaments train robbery may hark back to the good old days, but their days are closing fast. So, memorable lines from the wild bunch. Now, from Pekinpa, we will move on to more general kind of westerns and let us talk about the woman in the western. Uh, and now, this is a uh, very uh, important to note that women in um, the western, in classic westerns at least, they 
are of two extremes. So, you have the homemaker, the feminine and the civilizing woman, which who is a civilizing influence on the hero. They are often damsels in distress and very often blonde. On the other hand, the other two, the other extreme, you have prostitutes, barmaids and rape victims and very often dark haired. Okay, but uh, most often they too have hearts of gold and a soft corner for the hero. They often die for um, to save the hero's life. And there have been very few films with uh, women protagonists. Um, I mean, uh, western films with women protagonists. And one notable example is the Quick and the Dead. Are you aware of that, Siddharth? No, the Quick and the Dead is starring Sharon Stone as a western, as a cowgirl or a western heroine. Gene Hackman plays the evil uh, villain and Russell Crowe is the hero. Leonardo DiCaprio in one of his uh, earlier roles. Bad Girls is starring uh, Madeleine Stove and Andy McDowell. Okay, that is another example of cowgirls, so, 1994. Some classic westerns, Great Train Robbery, of course, we have been talking about this quite uh, often in this course and that is the first uh, um, movie with a proper narrative, we have often talked about it. Then Billy the Kid, 1941, Buffalo Bill, 1944, Stagecoach, My Darling Clementine, Red River and this was directed by Howard Hawks starring John Wayne and Monty Clift. The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, Shane, George Stephens, Shane is starring Alan Lord, Duel in the Sun, uh, this is Gore Vidal picture with Gregory Peck, High Noon with uh, Gary Cooper and Grace Kelly, McKenna's Gold again with Gregory Peck and then much later there was a lull in the western genre and its fortunes were revived with Dances with Wolves, directed by Kevin Costner and also starring Kevin Costner. It won several Academy Awards and then we had uh, Close on the Heels was Unforgiven, starring and directed by Clint Eastwood. The Magnificent Seven, starring Yul Briner. this is a reworking of Kurosawa's Seven Samurai. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, we have been talking about this, Robert Redford and Paul Newman, 310 to Yuma, um, I am talking about both the recent version and also the classic version, the older version. Some uh, famous directors, we have already talked about that, John Ford and Howard Hawks and actors, John Wayne is the supreme leader of the pack, followed by people like Howard Keel, Alan Ladd, Yul Briner, Gregory Peck, Robert Mitchum, Gary Cooper and later on Clint Eastwood. Red, uh, Red River, directed by Howard Hawks is another important uh, text of this category, 1948, where John Wayne plays Thomas Denson, a man obsessed with driving cattle from the south to California. So, it is also a road movie of sorts about Howard Hawks, we have often been talking about him and uh, Andre Bezon of Cahiers du Cinema often proclaimed Howard Hawks as one of the first and best American author directors. We have already done author theory. Uh, Hawks uh, began his career as a props man with the Mary Pickford company and from the editing department, he moved on to the script department and his great advantage over other new newcomers was the family money. So, he was not poor, he did not need to eke out a living and he could experiment. He lent some money to Jack Warner and financed some of the films uh, by associate producers. In 1922, Hawks wrote and directed two comedy shorts and in 1923, he wrote the screenplay for Jack Conway's Quicksand. So, that is the way the great Howard Hawks started his career.
um, Howard Hawks style, he relied not just on characters but, and the story, but also on the actors. So, that was his uh, strength. Uh, he gave uh, magnificent roles to actors and drew out great performances from them. Uh, dialogues and situations were often uh, modified during the filming. So, we are talking about improvisation on the sets. Uh, as the personality of the actor became fused with the character he was playing. Themes of male bonding often uh, come to the fore in all films of Howard Hawks. Think only angels have wings and so on. Now, coming from uh, the classic western to the spaghetti western and spaghetti, who is the champion here? Clint Eastwood, Clint Eastwood, Sergio Leone, remember that. Now, I am often asked, what is the difference between classic westerns and spaghetti? So, classic westerns are filmed and they reflect the American landscape, whereas the spaghettis were shot in Spain, okay. quite like, yeah, but desperado is about a, a gunslinger, uh, yeah, and here we are talking more about the cowboy kind of hero, yes. So, they are called spaghetti because it was believed that they were shot in Italy, but they were basically shot in Spain and Mexico borders. And most important, uh, most well known team is Sergio Leone, Clint Eastwood, uh, almost like John Ford, John Wayne combination. And invariably, these movies will have a score by Ennio Morricone. So, that is spaghetti. Now, let me also talk about another all time uh, great a classic western, The Searchers, directed by John Ford, 1956, where the hero is a war veteran, played by John Wayne. And he has just returned from uh, the Civil War, 1861 to 65. And you find plenty of shots of landscape, open wide spaces. Uh, the Monument Valley was a favorite, perennial favorite of John Ford, and he preferred shooting there. So, that uh, figures very prominently in the movie Monument Valley. The real uh, this is still is taken from the real location, and this location often finds place in all John uh, Ford movies. Now, the themes in The Searchers is a very dark, very provocative film. Hero is, and this is important, hero is openly biased against the Native Americans, the so called Indians. It is uh, morally ambiguous. The hero is simultaneously obsessive, racist, violence, monstrous, isolated, tormented, and he. Um, we are at one point. We all we are also made to realize that he is in love with his brother's wife. Okay, so the searchers. We cannot go into much details now at this point. So I'll uh, take you to another seminal text of uh, the Western genre. High Noon in 1952, Fred Zinnemann directed it, and uh, Carl Foreman, the screenwriter, was a blacklisted writer, but uh, uh, he made uh, quite an impact with the screenplay of High Noon. It was also it was also a response to the McCarthy period. Gary Cooper and Grace Kelly play the lead. The movie won four Oscars, and the film is a political allegory about the communist witch hunt of the 50s. The idea, the theme is again an individual is standing against a group of cowards in society. An important feature of uh, High Noon is that it starts at 10.35 am in the movie and ends at 12.10 noon. What does it suggest? Real time. Okay, real time. The movie is actually taking place in real time. We are told uh, that at 10.35, the hero is getting married and immediately after that, we are told that a bunch of crooks, um, these hooligans, once he had put them away in prison for a couple of years and they are now let out and they are coming here, coming back to the town to get their revenge on him. And everyone in the town advise him to leave. He is a sheriff there, but he just got married and he has, he is now posted in another town. But then he says, if the goons are coming, if the thugs are coming, how can I leave the town until my successor takes over? So, he is waiting for the next guy to take over and he would not run away. So, he is that kind of a typical American courageous hero 
but in a town full of cowards. So, again an allegory of the McCarthy period, where friends would not stand by friends. So, he it in a way condemns the US judicial system and society, where real villains are let off easily and the heroes are punished and are taken to task by goons. Now, let us talk about how contemporary western cinema has redefined the myth of the western, the American western. So, myth, western and American individualism vis a vis the western and its rugged landscape, how these things have been redefined, how western as a genre has been revisited in some of the contemporary films and the key texts that I would be discussing now are No Country for Old Men by Cohen Brothers and There Will Be Blood by Paul Thomas Anderson. Interestingly, both films were released in the year 2007. As we have been talking about, the myth of the American West includes glamorization of the West. Uh, we had narrative rituals of robbery, chase and subsequent retribution. We have had uh, the outlaw as the glamorized hero and we just saw a list of heroes, the outlaws who have been canonized. So, heroized outlaws that is that was the myth, um, uh, an entire school of myth has been focused on them which have been uh, centered on these glamorous, very charismatic kinds of outlaws. So, tradition of the cowboy as a mythic hero, cowboy uh, has always been regarded as a mythic hero of larger than life proportion. This has been heroized in several versions including in dime novels, in literature as well as in American rock music as late as in the 60s. For example, Bob Dylan's John Wesley Harding, Willie Nelson's Red Headed Stranger, Kenny Rogers and Eagle's Hotel Cal California. So, uh, it is nothing new for the western hero to be canonized. The west has always been seen as a land of opportunity and happiness and uh, but in a movie like No Country for Old Men, the counter myth is that fate and chance govern our lives more than free individualism. No Country for Old Men also interrogates the idea of American individualism. Both heroes, you know, as played by Josh Brolin and Javier, Bro Javier Bardem, they depend on no one. They choose not to depend on anyone. Josh Brolin character, if you remember, he does not even confide in his wife, who he loves so dearly. Javier Bardem is a mythical ghost, who arrives from nowhere and vanishes into the thin air. He even does surgery on himself. Based on comic McCarthy's novel, um, No Country for Old Men is set in the 80s and the title is taken from W. B. Yeats's Sailing to Byzantium. Interestingly, the iconography of the West, the rugged landscape, which is so full of hope and promise and also freedom in the traditional Western, is ruggedly bleak in No Country for Old Men. The movie is more uh, stylistically in the category of neo noir. It uses the recognizable element of elements of Noah, uh, moral ambivalence. Both our heroes are morally ambivalent, and uh, Javier Bardem, who plays Anton Sugar, is uh, an out and out social misfit. Uh, the film addresses anxiety and uh, responds to social changes, which are uh, right now so perceptible in the American society. The sheriff, who used to be such an important part in a traditional western and also in Noah, uh, you know we were talking about the truth seeker, the man of law, 
Okay. Now, he is on the sidelines, he is relegated to the sidelines. Um, Tommy Lee Jones's character, he, uh, he gives us the voice over narration, he is the sheriff here. And if you observe it closely, he adapts a very apocalyptic tone. He does talk about existential notions of free choice, but at the end the film offers no catharsis. The concept of the hero is again uh, extremely problematic in No Country for the Old Man. Uh, there is a, a Sugar's character is uh, decidedly uncompromising and uh, is based on violent justice. Justice according to his own uh, warped sense or uh, sense of the term rather. He abides by rules to enforce justice and uh, in the process takes many innocent lives. There are several gaps in the narrative. Now, we have been talking about narrative quite often in this course and if you uh, uh, observe the movie carefully, you will understand that Lou Ellen's, uh, that is Josh Brolin, the other hero's uh, death takes place off camera, off stage. We never know who killed him. right? There are many more missing details of his last moment, what was he up to, what was he doing. We know that he was heading towards the border, but who killed him finally, we would never know. Um, the movie which begins so violently, as the movie ends, as we, uh, as the film progresses, the on screen bloodshed reduces. So, there are several gaps in the narrative and the other day we have been talking about postmodern cinema. So, the movie in at several levels fulfills the requirement of a postmodern narratives. At one point, Sheriff famously says, America has always been like this, that is a tough country, cruel and harsh, eating his sons like Satan. The idea is that people who are given absolute power to enforce their laws and justice on to others ultimately end up devouring people. And uh, there is a strong subtext here, whenever any person or any society gets unlimited power and uh, takes it upon, upon itself to enforce justice, mm, then there is just mayhem and chaos all around. That is one strong message uh, of the film. Um, philosophically, the film hinges on the idea of absurdism. There are no heroes, decidedly, there are no heroes. You cannot call even Llewellyn a hero, because of his uh, moral ambivalence. And there are so many things about him that we never get to know. So, uh, we do not know uh, who is the real hero of the film. Perhaps it is the sheriff, but then he is a tired hero and therefore, he uh, no country for old men inverts the idea of uh, a lone ranger, a lone hero up against an unjust society. Okay. The sheriff is a tired old man who cannot now undo the injustices that have been taken pla taking place around, around him so far. So, there are no heroes, God is vanquished and evil is expanding in the world. The world is meaningless, there is no sense and no order in the world around us and nothing happens, nothing reasonable happens. Okay. So, there is no logic there is no cause and effect sense, which is, which was something, uh, uh, such an integral part of the traditional western. There is something happens and that which leads to a consequence. Here, people suffer without sense, without any logic. So, very absurdist in its philosophy. The movie adjudged the best film of 2007 uh, and also it was awarded for its uh, uh, very breathtaking photography by Roger Deakins. 
it beat films like you know Michael Clayton and uh, also Atonement, not to uh, forget there will be blood also. So, uh, it emerged as the best movie of that year and Javier Bardem won best performance by an actor in a supporting role. We are talking about the Academy Awards. Now, um, there will be blood. Let us talk about how there will be blood subverts the myth of the American Western and individualism. Um, as we all know, initially the West was taken away from the Indians by prospectors and its speculators and remaining land was sold to the pioneers who were the settlers from the East. Um, by the 1890s, the western frontier was declared closed. The pioneers or the founding fathers in the American literature have been celebrated in uh, the works of Walt Whitman, Mark Twain, uh, James Cooper and there has been a strong feeling of identification with these founding fathers. In fact, many of uh, the American literary heroes uh, they construct their identity or identities rather based on the myths of these pioneers, the founding fathers of the nation. The pioneers were celebrated in a mo movie called The Westerner 1940, which is about individuals fighting the capitalists, uh, the railroad owners, the old tycoons and the banks. So, um, uh, the movie starred Gary Cooper again in the role which he had played to perfection in several movies including High Noon, uh, the hero as a lone ranger, individual against society. How the West was won by John Ford um, again deals with the idea of westward expansion of the 19th century. It includes uh, many important events like the gold rush, the civil war, discovery of the oil wells and the building of the railroads. John Wayne's Alamo, uh, one of his pet projects and a very successful movie, um, again capitalizes on the quest for adventure and was meant to foster the spirit of nationalism and patriotism among the American people. He also, John Wayne, uh, um, you know, very, um, shall I use the word, uh, in a very megalomaniac way, uh, took it upon himself to cultivate a sense of history and pride in America's past through this movie. There Will Be Blood uh, is an indictment of American capitalism and the myth of the frontiersmen and cowboys who embodied individualism. The, the film is an interrogation of this deep sense of competitiveness among Americans and also the deep sense of accusativeness as Daniel Plainview played by Daniel Day Lewis and declares, I have a competition in me. Based upon Upton Sinclair's novel, Oil, uh, which was published in 1927, the film is set in 1898 during Southern California oil boom. And first 15 minutes of the film are eerily silent. If you have watched Sergio Leone's Once Upon a Time in the West and also his Once Upon a Time in America, also Kubrick's 2001 you will find how important the opening scenes are and uh, how minimalistic the dialogue is. So, th there is hardly any dialogue in the first 15 minutes of the film uh, as, we as we just see Daniel Plainview um, roughing his way up in the world. Okay. So, man versus rugged nature and this nature is cruel, is harsh is devouring. He almost loses his leg in an accident and then through the film he walks with a limp. So, 
the major themes in the movie are greed for oil, greed for land, um, family relationship, uh, obsession, revenge and struggle for power. The myth is that pioneers had steadfast morals and therefore, through hard work determination, they rose to prominence and that the uh, US was nourished solely by the blood and sweat of heroic common people. But this is not something that we get to see in there will be blood. So, the hero is anything uh, but a man of principles, he is unscrupulous, he stoops to any level to get what he wants and what he wants is absolute power. He is an individualist all right, but uh, an acute loner, when there is, when he is amidst people, he walks out, too much confusion. Uh, another memorable line from the movie, I look at other people and see nothing worth liking. He chooses alienation and estrangement from people. He is a misfit, but not in the tradition of the ideal western hero, a man who may be an outsider, but who has a heart of gold. So, there will be blood, subverts the myth, the traditional notion of the hero. Uh, the myth is that the western hero is a wanderer and never settles down and plain view clearly says, I see the worst in people, I want to rule and never ever explain myself. I have built my hatreds up over the years. So, it is not just um, a hero who wants to wander around. If Daniel Plainview does wander around for uh, the first uh, part of the film, first half of the film, but once he decides to settle down, it is to rule and to expand his empire. Interestingly, uh, the church is or religion is shown as the other side um, of capitalism. There is a church in the oil fields and while we witness Daniel Plain views greed and hatred for people, we also find hypocrisy and greed of the man of religion. So, what, what ultimately uh, is at the core? Uh, that religion and capitalism both are unprincipled, competitive and ruthlessly ambitious. Both these very important ideals, they become nothing but an allegory for desire to control people. A western hero, again another myth, restores family values and re-establishes order and then moves out. Think Shane or the searchers, the hero restores order and moves out, even high noon. But here, the hero is driven by revenge. By the end of the movie, he yells as he seeks uh, revenge, I am the third revelation, I am who the Lord has chosen and famously, I drink your milkshake. So, at many levels, both no country for old men and there will be blood, subvert notions of individualism, the rugged landscape, American competitiveness and capitalism and also notions of patriarchy. So, the western has come a long way and therefore, it is all the more interesting to observe that both these movies which were made in 2007 have a strong political subtext and if you read the American history in recent times, then you will understand how relevant these two films are to our times. So, thank you very much.